The next item of business is a debate on motion 4621 in the name of Ben McPherson on update on social security benefits. I'd be grateful if members who wish to speak in the debate could press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Ben McPherson to speak to and move the motion up to 12 minutes, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Social security is an important human right. It is a shared investment in building a fairer and better society. None of us know when we might need it, or if someone close to us might need it. And that is why collectively, especially in these serious and challenging times, we Scotland's politicians must work together to continue to successfully deliver and develop our devolved social security system based on our shared principles of dignity, fairness and respect. Today I wish to update Parliament on the progress that we have made, particularly during the pandemic, and then how we build on this strong foundation to safely and securely deliver the remaining devolved benefits. Today's debate is a chance for us to reflect on the remarkable progress that has been made since this Parliament unanimously passed the Social Security Act in 2018, and it is a chance to look forward to what further change and assistance this Scottish Government will deliver for the people we serve. Because, Presiding Officer, we have used, are using and will continue to use our devolved powers proactively, purposefully and passionately to strengthen and develop our still fairly new public service and to deliver significant extra financial support to people in our communities who need it most. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government has now introduced 12 benefits, seven of which are brand new forms of support only available in Scotland. And in this financial year, through record investment of £3.9 billion in benefit expenditure, we will be providing support to over 1 million people. We have chosen to invest more than the money being transferred to us by the UK Government by around £360 million this financial year, a decision we have taken as a Government on how we allocate our limited resources and use our limited powers to introduce new forms of support to tackle child poverty, promote equality and mitigate pressures on the cost of living. We are taking a range of actions. For example, by the end of 2022, we will extend the Scottish Child Payment to under-16s and increase it to £25 per week per child. By that point, around 430,000 children living in low-income households could be eligible, a four-fold increase on the 104,000 children we are already helping. I will give way to Pam Duncan Clancy. Pam Duncan Clancy. Thank you, and I, I, I thank the Minister for, for taking this intervention. We have had um, various briefings uh, come in ahead of this debate, as, as we will all know, and all of them have pointed to the fact that children are still living in poverty today. They can't wait till the end of the year, and particularly children on bridging payments. So will the Government commit to doubling the bridging payments? Minister. So, uh, we have answered Pam Duncan Glancy on this point several times, and, and as she knows, the reason we cannot extend the Scottish Child Payment until the end of this year is because we have to go through a process with the DWP to access the data and implement the change systematically. Uh, and we have provided bridging payments in the meantime in order to provide that extra assistance, and that is welcomed by families across Scotland. As is our package of five family payments uh, for low-income families, worth over £10,000 by the time a family's first child turns six, and £9,700 9, for subsequent children. This compares to less than 1,800 for an eligible, eligible family's uh, first child in England and Wales. That is the difference of more than £8,200 for every eligible child born in Scotland, uh, proof that we are delivering for the households who need it most using our powers. We also reacted to the cost of living crisis by increasing eight Scottish benefits by 6 per cent, closer to the rate of inflation, instead of previous plans uh, of 3.1 per cent CPI. What is more, we both delivered and introduced several of these new benefits through the pandemic, including the Scottish Child Payment and our complex disability benefits, which Audit Scotland last week said, and I quote, was a significant achievement. I will from Miles Briggs. Miles Briggs. Thank you for the uh, Minister for taking this intervention. Audit Scotland also stated that the implement, implementation costs regarding new devolved, devolved benefits are not routine, routinely reported on in the public domain and inevitably, and I quote what they say, makes it difficult for those scrutinising roles to track costs over time. What assessment has the Minister made of those comments? 
Minister. We, we, we have welcomed all the recommendations in the Audit Scotland report and will be working to implement those recommendations and work with the auditor as we move forward, as we have done through the process. Um, naturally, and just with regard to progress during the pandemic, our delivery partners at the Department of Work and Pensions also had to reprioritise their programme of work. And we are now working with them uh, to plan our timetable uh, for delivery of the remaining devolved benefits uh, and transferring around 700,000 cases from the DWP to Social Security Scotland. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank those involved in the delivery of our devolved Social Security benefits, all of my officials in the Scottish Government, UK ministers and civil servants who have been involved, everyone at Social Security Scotland, our experienced panels, SCOS, DACBIG, and every stakeholder and individual who has contributed to the development of our 12 benefits and those that we are currently preparing to introduce. And on that note, Presiding Officer, let me now move to a new benefit that will directly support around 400,000 low-income households with their energy costs. Beginning in winter 22-23, we will introduce our low-income winter heating assistance. This new benefit will replace the DWP's cold weather payments and will guarantee an annual £50 payment to around 400,000 low-income households each winter, an investment of around £20 million a year. The current £25 cold weather payment is only paid if the weather gets cold enough and for a sustained period of time. In contrast, our replacement winter heating benefit will be a guaranteed £50 payment, ensuring it is targeted, stable, reliable financial support to those who need it most. It will deliver certainty and no longer be tied to temperatures recorded at weather stations, which are often miles from people's homes. And it represents an investment of around £20 million a year. Since 2014-15, there have only been two years when spend on cold weather payments in Scotland has been above £20 million, including only £325,000 to just 11,000 households in the winter we have just had. Therefore, there is no doubt that this new Scottish benefit will be of huge help to people in the coming winter and another way this government is supporting people and mitigating against the, the cost of living crisis. Following that, the next benefit uh, we will be introducing is, is Scottish Carers Assistance, a replacement for Carers Allowance. And I'm pleased to announce today that we will begin to roll out Scottish Carers Assistance by the end of 2023 with full national introduction in spring 2024. The final dates will be agreed following our ongoing work with the UK Government. This is a key milestone for our new benefit. Our consultation on Scottish carers' assistance and our plans for future improvements to increase the support available to carers has just ended. And these plans include an additional payment for those caring for more than one disabled person and proposals to remove full-time education restrictions and increase the earnings limit so carers uh, can earn more and still get financial support. We will consider the responses to the consultation uh, and later this year we will confirm the improvements we will make and, and when we will be able to make them. In the meantime, we will continue to pay the carers allowance supplement, real tangible to support to around 90,000 carers. Uh, we have now delivered £188 million of carers allowance supplement support since it was introduced in 2018, including two additional payments uh, in 2020 and 21 in response to the pandemic. We are also, of course, delivering significant changes this year as well with our new disability benefits. Uh, after successfully rolling it out last winter, child disability payment has already helped an estimated 3,000 children. And just a few months ago, I was proud that we successfully introduced adult disability payment, our replacement for the UK personal independence payment. On the 21st of March, we launched it in three council areas, and this will be phased in across 10 more areas in the coming months, ahead of full national introduction at the end of August. Adult disability payment is delivering significant improvements. From never using the private sector to carry out health assessments, to providing an independent advocacy service and short-term assistance if people are challenging a review decision. And as further evidence of our human rights-based approach in action, we have introduced indefinite awards for people on the highest level of adult disability payment whose needs are unlikely to change, providing the most severely disabled people with long-term financial security. And we have moved away from the DWP's definition of terminal illness to one based on clinical judgment instead of life expectancy. Importantly as well, benefit applications from people with terminal illness will be fast-tracked 
and paid at the maximum rate. Presiding officer, adult disability payment is without doubt the most complex benefit we have introduced, and the seamless and safe and secure transfer of hundreds of thousands of people's payments from the DWP is not a simple administrative process. We will start to move personal independence payment awards from the middle of next month uh, and working age disability living allowance awards from the end of August in cases when individuals would otherwise need to undergo an assessment or reassessment with the DWP. People in Scotland who are having their cases transferred do not need to do anything. We will do it and we will do it seamlessly and we will keep them informed through the process. Prime Officer, there is a lot more I could say about the remarkable progress we have made since the Social Security Act was passed just four years ago. In that time, we have created a new public service for Scotland, delivered new and replacement benefits, and positively impacted on thousands of lives. And I look forward this afternoon to hearing from colleagues about how together we can make an even bigger difference. We have ambitions to help more people as we use our powers to create a modern, future-proof social security system. A system that can serve the people of Scotland well and effectively for decades to come. And one that embodies one of the four key words on that mace before us today. Compassion. To do that, we will have to be ambitious, but also appropriately realistic. We will have to move forward purposefully, but also be responsible. We will have to put people first and not party politics. And we will need to work together to encourage benefit take-up and remove stigma that's unfortunately built up in previous years around Social Security. Presiding officer, the months and years ahead are arguably the most significant for the new system that we have created and for those of us who serve in communities across Scotland. And so in these serious times, I encourage my fellow MSPs to play their part in supporting our constituents to access any support that's available that they are entitled to and for colleagues to be constructive in the next really important phase of delivering social security benefits. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you. And members may wish to know that we do have some time available to give back for any interventions. And I now call on Miles Briggs to speak to and move amendment 4621.1. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, Following the sweeping devolution delivered in the 2016 Scotland Act, this Parliament does indeed now have unprecedented powers and influence over Social Security here in Scotland. It goes to the heart of the devolution settlement following the 2014 independence referendum, where this Parliament is responsible now for a greater number of decisions we take for the people of Scotland. Not only is the Scottish Government of the day able to top up UK-wide reserve benefits, it also has full control over 11 benefits that we previously administered uh, by the UK Government, including uh, child disability payments. And if the pandemic has demonstrated anything, it is the benefits of the broad shoulders of the UK, which has helped to protect and support families to get through the pandemic, from the furlough scheme to the unprecedented support which has been provided to families and businesses the length and breadth of the UK. And we saw more of that support today from the Chancellor's statement as well. But I would like to bring, begin today's debate with where I do agree with the government. And it was the final point which the minister made, and that was with regard to the implementation of a clinically determined definition of terminal illness and the fast tracking of these applications for support. I really do believe is a welcome step forward, something I, I very much welcome, including uh, the definition of um, indefinite awards uh, for the Scottish Disability Assistance. Um, that is something which many of us have campaigned for across this parliament, including yourself, presiding officer. And I think it is a welcome day that we've seen that finally taken forward. Despite the SNP Green government's motion, it does have to be said that the establishment and transition to date of Social Security Scotland has not been all plain sailing. Now, we are acutely aware of how ministers have to hand back administrative powers, for example, over the severe disability allowance to the DWP. Moreover, despite recent welcome progress, the transition has been far too slow. And it's worth reflect, reflecting that this has been nearly now a decade after ministers received these powers um, before we will see the case transfer from the DWP to Social Security Scotland. Yes. Minister. Thank, thank you, President Officer. Thanks, Mr Briggs, for giving me. I, I would just be really interested if Mr Briggs, from a practical, realistic position, could give any suggestion of how we could have gone quicker. 
because we've introduced new benefits like the Scottish Child Payment that the Conservatives welcomed and, and actually campaigned to be doubled in the last election. So you know, it's, it's very easy to say things should have gone quicker, but how? How would you have done it quicker? Miles Briggs. <laughs> this is about holding government to account, and the specific promise made by ministers was that the new system would be fully in place before the 2021 election. Indeed, Audit Scotland only last week warned that the current timescales that we are seeing are challenging. Uh, regarding the delivery of these new benefits as well. And as I've stated in previous uh, debates in the Chamber, it is in all our interest to see Social Security Scotland succeed. We all want to see that. But the organisation must deliver efficiency and cost-effective assessments and payments. And that's something all of us uh, will continue to hold the government to account on. As is the case of any government body or quango, the Scottish people rightly expect, Minister, um, that these resources will be managed effectively and efficiently to deliver value for money. And as the Social Justice and Social Security Committee has recently heard, projections around spend on devolved benefits um, are now estimated to see a gap of, of at least three quarters of a billion pounds by the end of this Parliament. And as my colleague Jeremy Balfour has previously outlined, SNP Green Ministers also have not outlined where we are seeing costs around rebranding, for example, around PIP, which is ostensibly just a repeat of the same system. Ministers have not said any changes which will be made to this, and that's something I think the committee and members across uh, the Parliament want to see a change. Very briefly. Minister. I, I would just highlight to Mr Briggs that he's just pointed out a difference in the, in the definition of terminal illness. And I stated the, a difference in terms of indefinite awards in my opening remarks, as well as the way people will access benefits. So, you know, let's, let's be serious here. Yeah. Miles Briggs. Specifically around criteria around PIP and what it seems to be a rebranding of that payment. Um, we need to see where these changes will be. At committee, the Minister has not out outlined any of those either. Um, we also know that the current Social Security Scotland cost of delivering benefits stands around 10 per cent of total resources compared to 6 per cent of the DWP. Now, yes, it is a new organisation, um, but last year alone, Social Security Scotland saw um, overspend costs of around £44 million. Pounds. Now, I know this Parliament and certainly members on the, the committees which are looking at this would like fur further clarity from the government over where this projected expenditure in the future will be controlled and what plans there are uh, to plug some of these funding gaps. It is concerning that the costs of setting up Social Security Scotland have more than tripled what SNP ministers estimated they would cost, and that's something I think we still haven't heard clear answers from. Today's debate is an important opportunity to highlight, though, the need for more transparency from ministers, and I asked him with regards to Audit Scotland's... Yes. Yep. Jim Fairley. Thank you very much for taking the intervention. I'd just last like to ask Myers Briggs, did you actually agree with the UK Government's decision to cut the £20 universal credit uplift? Myles Briggs. Well, that's not the point we're debating today. I think in terms of the additional resources we provided at the start of the pandemic, I think that was very welcome. Um, but the th things we are responsible, Mr Fairley, I think we need to concentrate on, and certainly the £44 million overspend is something we should be able to discuss and look at, because Audit Scotland are saying quite clearly that the Scottish Government are making it difficult for scrutiny and for those of us who are carrying that scrutiny to track the costs over time. Now, the, the Minister says he accepts all of Audit Scotland's recommendations. I welcome that fact and hope we will be seeing uh, action on that very soon. Because due to this lack of transparency, Audit Scotland are urging the Scottish Government to make these important changes now, including publishing a new programme around the business case, so that Scots can see exactly how this money is being spent. The future financial sustainability of our welfare system is vitally important, and these additional costs and duplications of the system need to be fully considered as we move forward. Um, presiding officer, to conclude, and in the spirit of the 2016 Scotland Act, Scotland should be able to have a unique and distinctive approach to social security. We all agree with that. From elsewhere in the UK, Scottish Conservatives have outlined as well our priorities of reform which we want to see and something I hope the Minister will engage on, including the extension of bereavement support for carers and a new top-up benefit as well for veterans. This is something which the Minister has acknowledged in committee and I hope that's something we will also see going forward. There are, however, serious budget concerns and the Scottish Government need to be clearer on its long-term vision for Social Security Scotland and the spend we will see and lay out the practical steps that it will make to make sure the body will be more transparent and accessible to the public. I move the amendment in my name. Thanks very much. Thank you. I now call on Pam Duncan-Glancy to speak to and move Amendment 4621.2.
Thank you, President Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. The devolution of Social Security was a key moment. It was a chance to be radical, to create a new system, and remove the most undignified and unjust policies of the past. But the SNP have failed to meet that moment. They had warm words, but as, but as is too often the case, they have failed to turn them into action. They failed to deliver on promises, even when those promises have been their flagship policies. Six years on from passing the Social Security Act, the Scottish Government is still regularly announcing delays, opting to leave powers in the hands of the Tories and handing the DWP over a third of its budget in the process. I will. Minister. I thank Pam Duncan Glancy for taking the intervention. I would just pose the same question to Pam Duncan Glancy as I opposed to, to Miles Briggs. It's very easy to sit and say, and, and to say that things should have gone faster and we want to move quicker. Everyone wants to move quicker in this parliament, but it's how, how do we do that? And I can't see, looking back on the trajectory from 2018 to now, with the circumstances that we faced, how that could have been done any quicker, considering we introduced new benefits like the Scottish Child Payment, which I know Pam, Dunkley, uh, Pam Duncan Glancy really strongly supports. Pam Duncan Glancy. Uh, I thank the, the, the Minister for, for that intervention, and, and I, I do strongly support the Scottish Child Payment. Um, there, are, there are a number of things I think that could be done much more quickly, but one of the most important things I think is that we should have been in a position to, um, the government should have been in a position to ask the UK government for the information it needed well ahead, in, well ahead of announcing policy on it. And when the minister, the UK minister came to committee and we asked the UK minister why the data wasn't available from the DWP, particularly for Scottish child payment, the minister said that the Scottish government hadn't asked them for it in advance. So I would strongly urge the Scottish government to make sure that it is engaging that is engaging as early as possible with the public, but also with um, the UK government on matters like that. I will. Shona Robertson. So I, I think the, the point that the, the minister was making was that somehow we should have um, asked their permission in advance of increases to Scottish child payment. Uh, now, I don't think that's right. And they had a lot of lead-in time from the first announcement of Scottish child payment. But surely Pam Duncan Glancy, who calls for things to, to be changed and increased all the time, would recognise that the decisions about the level should lie with us. But the DWP and the ministers had plenty of lead-in time in order to get the data issues resolved. The issue was a disagreement on how the data issues should be resolved. Pam Duncan Glancy. Um, I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that intervention. And if the Cabinet Secretary wants to, to look over the, the official record of the committee, um, the Cabinet Secretary, Secretary will see that they said specifically that they hadn't been given enough notice ahead of policy changes, which is why it's important, I think, at this point to also say that if there is any intended policy change around the adult disability payment review, that information is going to be absolutely key as soon as possible, because people need to know that there are the systems in place to deliver the changes that they so desperately, desperately need and want. And meanwhile, all of this is happening. Poverty is indeed rife. Debt is racking up and people are struggling to make ends meet. The key workers for the pandemic, those who put their lives on the line to protect ours in roles with high exposure to COVID, social care and education, predominantly were women. And with the powers we have here, we could have seen more support for them, recognising the role they played, including as unpaid carers stepping in when the state pulled out. Instead, the uplift to the carer supplement was cut. And then there's disabled people, many of whom are living in poverty in Scotland. The Scottish Government is now finally in the process of rolling out the adult disability payment, but all it's done is tinker about the edges of it. I welcome the improvements to the application, but let's be honest, that wasn't a high bar. The SNP could have been making real changes by removing the 20 metre rule and the 50 per cent rule in recognition of the fact that those arbitrary numbers allow for no rec recognition of fluctuating conditions, including long COVID and MS, but they haven't. They've said they must first prioritise safety and secure transfer. I will. Can I get my time back, please, um, President Officer? You can indeed, Minister. Thank you, President Officer, and thanks again to Pam Duncan Glancy. I would, I would just ask Pam Duncan Glancy, are, are you, is Pam Duncan Glancy therefore suggesting that we should have a two tier system as we undertake case transfer? Because that would be the reality if we made changes to eligibility criteria until we have uh, undertaken case transfer. Pam Duncan Glancy. That, that is in fact not what I'm suggesting, although as we heard in committee this morning, there will be a two-tier system, particularly for the 38,000 people who are currently on DLA and going to be moving to adult disability payment. And so it is possible, where there is the will, for the government to find solutions to these problems. What matters more than anything else is that people are not facing the DWP 
systems that are not giving them adequate amounts of money to live on and that are ruling people out of getting access to support on arbitrary figures like 50% rules and 20 metre rules. And the sooner we can do away with that in Scotland, the better. And at this rate, substantial changes around eligibility and adequacy in adult disability payment won't be in place in this Parliament, despite both financial and legal competence being entirely devolved for years. Beside enough, it's a system that doesn't meet the needs of children either. Child poverty still remains at shamefully high levels. I engage with third sector organisations, as I know the Cabinet Secretary and Minister does, and they have been sharing stories with us about families sharing blankets, children sharing the free school meals. People are coming together to support each other while governments are failing to step in. Aberlour told the Social Justice and Social Security Committee last week that it is not relative child poverty they are seeing, it is absolute child poverty, complete destitution. The Child Poverty Delivery Plan concluded that with a fair wind and a good day, we could scrape through the relative poverty target next year, and I hope we do. But it is also admitted that even with that same optimistic outlook, the absolute child poverty target for 23-24 will be missed and 16 per cent of children will still remain in destitution. The Scottish Child Payment is welcome, as I have said before, but at its current rate and in its current unfinished state, it is not doing enough. Three out of four children living in poverty are not receiving the money they should be getting on it. This, the clumsiness of the rollout is costing the poorest children upwards of £5 million a week. The Government blamed the DWP, but as I said earlier, the Committee have heard that they have not asked for the information quick enough. The SNP made yet another headline-grabbing announcement, but they have not had the plans to back it up. People deserve and expect better than this. And then, of course, there are bills. A quarter of people in Scotland are in fuel poverty, and after today's annou Tuesday's announcements, it is only going to get worse. The reality is neither government are doing enough to address it. In fact, and on fuel poverty, we see another example of the government failing to live up to the rhetoric. In the fuel strategy, they rightly recognise that disabled people of all ages have a higher cost of living as a result of fuel costs. Yet when they had the chance to extend child winter heating allowance to all disabled people, regardless of age, they didn't. They had the power to use it, but they didn't. Fuel poverty is already affecting 619,000 households in Scotland, and that number is going to increase. And people who are already struggling are finding they can't make ends meet, they can't pay their bills. 218,000 of those people are households with older people in them. That's why we proposed fully costed plans that would have given people on pension credit £400 to mitigate some of the rises in energy bills. We would have given the same to people on carers' allowance supplement, child winter heating assistance and people on council tax reduction. Please but, conclude, And, and put the rest Glancy. to the welfare fund so that people could get the help they need to. The Tory government in Westminster have always let us down on this, but here in Scotland, where we should be using our powers, the SNP have failed to. It's time to stop messing about, get the staff needed in place, sort the IT, move pavements over at pace and deliver the promised new radical social security system that people in Scotland so desperately need. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Willie Rennie. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Um, I know the Minister probably finds me rather uh, curmudgeonly on occasion and a tad uh, critical of the Government's management of its responsibilities. That's because I'm usually right. Um, the Government's record is pretty terrible in so many areas. But I plan to tread new territory this afternoon and compliment those responsible for the progress so far in Social Security Scotland. Don't get too carried away. <laughs> It will be limited, Jim Fairley. Um, it is not going to go too far. Uh, but to those uh, in Dundee and elsewhere who have been working throughout this last period, it is a big programme. It was delayed, no doubt, but it has got to be recognised um, as progress. And I think ministers do deserve uh, some credit as well. Ben McPherson, I find him an open and approachable minister. Uh, he is also uh, focused in his work, dedicated to it. There is no doubt about that. And in fact, Jean Freeman, I think, um, for setting up the implementation plan at the beginning probably deserves some credit as well. Right, that's enough of that. I'm coming out in a rash now. Um, <laughs> because, but it is important to recognise that there's warnings in this Audit Scotland report as well. There's still a, a huge amount to be done. If you look at just the adult disability payment, something we were discussing yesterday, going from just a few thousand just now, 20,000, up to almost half a million in just five years. I mean, we've only just started on the adult disability payment, so we do need to keep our feet on the ground. Um, there's also the extension to the child payment to 200,000 older children, the 6 to 15 range, by the end of this year. 
that's a big step um, as well. So we know that there were problems with the, the child disability payment rollout. We knew there was issues with that, and it's not unreasonably. Pandemic did create some of the issues, but it just shows that the system um, is not as robust as perhaps the minister would like uh, to think. And the people who are dependent on these payments, the adult disability payment, but also the, the child payment, need the money. They need it on time. They're cutting right to the edge every single month. They run out of money before the end uh, of the week. So they need the money without delays. So there's no slack in this. We need to make this work, absolutely, because we know the consequences it has for people's lives if we don't get this right. And I did ask the Minister about how confident he was yesterday um, of delivering this. How confident was he of the timetable? And he talked about the system quite rightly. He didn't express any confidence. Now, perhaps you can maybe clear that up now. Minister. Thank Mr Rennie for, for giving way. And I am glad to have the second opportunity to just emphasise that I am confident of the robust processes in which both recruitment, training and proper investment into our IT systems uh, has taken uh, that has taken place so far and that is taking place uh, as we speak and will be as we roll out uh, the different phases of adult disability payment and crucially undertake case transfer. He is right to raise these serious points and, and I am very confident that, that, that we will do this right and get people their money uh, on time and when they expect it. Will he uh, we will hold him to account for that, the Minister, because it is important. And it is not just me who will hold him to account. All the people, the children and those with disabilities will hold him to account to make sure that is met. So I hope he is right. I hope he's right. Um, and there needs to be a focus on cost too. Miles Briggs um, was right about that. The cost of the benefits an additional, what, £760 million, according to Audit Scotland. Um, and the implementation costs have doubled since 2017. And I know the criteria has changed and there's a different scope. But nevertheless, it's quite an increase from what was originally planned. And I understand the, the purpose of having the agile uh, system, which has got a focus on the needs of the user. I understand the needs for that. But it does come with costs to the system. And we need to recognise that the, you know, money is not unlimited. And we need to make sure that we've got a system in balance. So I'd like to know from the Minister, perhaps he's summing up, how he's going to keep control of those uh, costs. And we've also we've heard more today from the Minister, but we do need the full details of the replanning of several uh, benefits that um, are having to be rescheduled. The pension age disability payment, the um, the carers, various carers' payments, but also the employment injury uh, assistance. All of that needs to be set out in detail because people are dependent uh, on those benefits as well. Now, the cost of living crisis has got to be at the centre of everything that we think about in this Parliament. It's going to plunge huge numbers of people into poverty, and we've seen and we've met many people who are experiencing that already, and it's only going to get worse. Um, today's package from the Chancellor will help uh, to some degree, but we must be ready to do more, and this Parliament must do more as well. The Child Poverty Action Group uh, are calling for a number of steps, including the doubling of the, the bridging payments for the Scottish Child Payment, and I hope the Minister will address that too and make sure there is a, a commitment, because those children are desperate for that money right now. And there are thousands of carers who just get nowhere near any carers' support. And that needs to be addressed before long. Thousands and thousands of people who care eh, for loved ones get no recognition for that. Now, eh, when I asked our representatives eh, on the Smith Commission, Tavish Scott and Michael Moore, eh, to make the case back in eh, 2015 for the transfer of significant powers welfare powers. I did so because I believed that the non-universal credit items should largely be devolved. I wanted greater synergy with the work that this uh, Parliament does. I thought it was a substantial transfer of powers, but it was also reasonable. It created a big multi-billion pound budget. It was not all what the SNP wanted, but it was uh, significant. A few months earlier, if we cast our mind back, the SNP were claiming we were going to deliver independence within 16 months. Seven years later, seven years later, on the transfer of the benefits, and we're not even near the end of it. I'm actually coming to my conclusion. 
um, we're not anywhere near the full delivery. That's all I point out. I understand what the Minister says about timing. These things do take time to implement. But we were promised this grand new welfare system and benefit system. We were promised that independence would be delivered in 16 months, years later. I think that should be a sobering lesson for the SNP. But I just want to conclude, President Officer. Um, we have tried to work constructively with the government uh, throughout this. We support dignity, fairness and respect. We think when we're forging a new welfare system, the country needs to come together to do its best to make sure it works effectively. And we will continue with that approach, as I hope I have showed the Minister today that we are determined to do. Thanks very much. Thank you. We move to the open debate, and I call Eleanor Whittam to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise today to support the Scottish Government motion, and I think it's extremely important that we do take a moment to reflect on the fact that in four short years, including in the face of a pandemic when priorities rightly shifted, since the Act was passed in 2018, our Government has taken on the major feat of disentangling a complex benefit system. Remember, this is a system that is so complex that the UK Chancellor advised us only a fortnight ago that computer says no to upgrading benefits more than once a year, as the antiquated system meant it was simply an insurmountable <laughs> obstacle to do it in any other way. So, and whilst the, he has been dragged kicking and screaming today to agree an inflationary uplift to benefits, it won't happen until, surprise, surprise, next year. So not only have we disentangled a complex, onerous system that had bits of paper warehoused all across the UK, we now find ourselves in a position where our new Social Security Scotland agency is delivering 12 benefits, of which seven are entirely new and only available in Scotland, a feat that Audit Scotland rightly describes as a significant achievement in challenging circumstances. Now, these new Scottish only payments, including the game-changing Scottish Child Payment. These are payments that third sector partners across the rest of the UK are desperate to see replicated in their own countries. But sadly, the political will at UK level is more interested in capping benefits rather than investing in their people. Whilst we in this place have a government that chooses to mitigate the hated benefit cap, which plunges predominantly women and children into abject poverty ideological austerity created welfare warfare that also saw women being told a third child will only be supported if they were conceived during rape. This is also a system that plunged 400,000 children UK-wide into poverty overnight by removing the £20 universal credit uplift. Shameful. I wonder if any on the Tory benches here today have made representation to their UK government colleagues to reverse these callous welfare cuts, which analysis show would lift an estimated 70,000 people in Scotland, including 30,000 children, out of poverty by 2024. Contrast this with our approach in this place, which decided our agency was to be built with fairness, dignity and respect at its heart, and core principles that do include seeing Social Security as an investment in the people of Scotland and as a human right that is essential to the realisation of human rights, other human rights, and which will contribute to the reduction of poverty across our country. Right back at the beginning of the creation of this first new public service to be created since devolution, I remember as part of my work as the cause of the community wellbeing spokesperson, being moved to the point of tears when hearing from those involved in the experience panels about how much trauma a brown envelope through the door invoked. As someone who was previously in receipt of said brown envelopes and who also supported many folk to navigate the often complex and cruel world that sees brown envelopes become the stuff of nightmares, I was relieved to see this level of engagement with lived experience shape the way in which our new agency operates. This is, after all... I will. Jeremy Balfour. Oh, it was a member slightly surprised that we've got such a brand new system that so early on that 2,000 people receiving Scottish child disability had to wait four days, a whole weekend, without receiving more money. Do you think the system really is working that well? Eleanor Whittam. I think we are always going to, to see some hiccups, but I would just like to point out to, to the member that you know, we are how many years down the line in terms of the rollout of PIP? And, you know, we're still, you know, 13 years in and it's, it's still not rolled out fully. That's why we have people on DLE and legacy benefits. And, as my colleagues are saying from, from their positions, we also have a five-week cruel wait to get your first payment of universal credit. So, 
This is, after all, our, our social security agency built for all of us, and it is imperative that we look that we took the time and the effort to ensure we didn't replicate nor bake in the shortcomings and the inequity of the UK system. It is now also incumbent upon all of us to work hard to make, to, to make sure that we maximise benefit uptake. We want to figure out how do we get past those practical solutions of data sharing to ensure that families get everything they're entitled to. And I do repeat the call from the Minister. Right across these chambers, please get it out on your social media channels. Make sure everybody knows what they're entitled to. As convener of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee, I recently travelled to Dundee to Social Security Scotland with my committee colleague Emma Roddick to hear firsthand about how the transfer of adult disability payment was progressing. And I was struck by how impassioned the staff were and how they appreciated the time afforded to them with the phased rollout that this enables them to be fleet of foot in face of challenges and respond accordingly. They spoke about culture and practice developing that gives me the confidence that our guiding principles are playing out in real time. And this was confirmed by the recent study that shows 90% of Social Security customers, uh, Scotland customers rated the service as good or very good. But, Presiding Officer, the thing that resonated most with me that day is the application form for ADP itself. And this is not tinkering around the edges. It could not be more further removed from the application form for personal independence payment. It is a form that has been crafted with lived and worked experience in mind and dignity at its heart. Both my colleague Emma and Roddick and I were emotional as we both know only too well the positive impact it will have on those of us in Scotland who find ourselves eligible for such payment. Indefinite awards and no dehumanising um, private sector assessments also signal a brand new approach. So despite the ludicrous labour assertion that we are doing nothing with our powers, eligible families in Scotland will receive more than £10,000 by the time their first child turns six and 9,700 for subsequent children. Contrast this, as the Minister said, with only 1,800 pounds um, in England and Wales, and only 1,300 pounds for subsequent children. Doing this with one hand tied behind our back, just imagine what we could do with all the powers of a normal, everyday, independent country. Thank you. Thank you. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Carol Mocken. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It seems that every time Scotland's social security benefits are debated in this chamber, the Scottish Government are able to report a small amount of progress on the issue, but this is never the amount of progress that they should be reporting. Despite the progress we have seen, and I welcome what has happened over the last year, it remains the case that this Government will not have finished taking control of all devolved benefits until nearly a decade, nearly a decade after they first received some of these powers. Content? Point. Minister. Uh, just, just for context, I wonder if he, if he wishes to reflect on uh, the, the rollout of universal credit, which was legislated for in 2012 and is still being rolled out. So, you know, I think let, let's be reasonable here. Yes. Alexander Stewart. I, I thank the Minister for the, for the intervention. Uh, but I, 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 you, you cannot mix and match the process, Minister, and you are trying to do that today. So over the period we have seen the estimated cost of Social Security more than triple compared to the original estimates. Given this, it is disappointing, though perhaps not surprising, to read the self congratulatory motion from the Scottish Government today, which estimates and ignores many of the delays that have taken place since the Act uh, back in 2016. And this follows last week's claim that the Government were being ambitious with the delivery timeline for these benefits. To say that claim uh, is stretching the facts is a little bit, to say the least, presiding officer. And as we've already heard today, Audit Scotland reported on the Scottish Government's progress in delivering devolved benefits, which was helpful and highlighted that there were some key developments over recent years. And there have been some key developments, but they have not been enough, uh, presiding officer. For example, the report highlights that the potential benefits we will see from the Scottish Child Payment rollout of which it is speeding and forward. There have been so many delays with that process. It is welcome to see that we are preparing for the future, for example, for the child, uh, Scottish Child Payment, as well as underway, and we report the highlights meeting the proposed timescales. But it, these are going to be extremely challenging. Extremely challenging is what the report suggests because of the sharing of data issues. I would like to make some more progress. Going forward, I hope to continue engagement between the Social Security Scotland and the DWP, because it is vitally important that there is that continued support between both of them, that they are on track to ensure that there is no further delays 
in the rollout, because with no delays, it will be game-changing. And we acknowledge that. We want to see these benefits delivered. We all want to see individuals receiving that benefit. But it could be going faster, and we've already talked about issues in IT and rollout uh, and, and offices. All of that comes into the equation, presiding officer. So Audit Scotland report talks about the launch of the child disability payment and the phased rollout of the adult disability payment. The launch of these benefits may have taken far longer than originally hoped, but now it's estimated that ensuring that we ensure that the transfer of the 300,000 people who are currently in receipt of PIP goes smoothly. One disappointing feature of the adult disability payment has been to highlight the previously we talked about that this will not take place and the criteria will not change until at least 2025. The Scottish Conservatives are clear that the devolution of powers should have meant that beginning of the disability approach to social security, one takes the opportunity, was much more flexible in ensuring that these powers were brought forward. The decision to keep the eligibility criteria of PIP and DAP at the same so far long as hardly has said that the government makes sure that these powers are there. I have also raised concerns previously, presiding officer, uh, about the total uh, removal of the, the personal assessment as uh, the application of DAP. While this decision may have been, been notable intentions uh, behind it, it remains the case that it is unintended consequences. There will be unintended consequences because of that. Certain individuals may struggle to provide sufficient data to support their application through the medical data, along with the consequences that they are risk and there may well be the information going forward. I hope the potential pitfalls such as these are considered in the case of transfer from PIP, and that continues in the coming years. Presiding officer, there is much more to be done in order to fully capitalise on Scotland's devolved social security powers, but one group which we have talked about in the past is carers. The pandemic has presented the opportunity to view the needs of carers in a new light and consider the best way we can support them. These benches have talked about for long advocated the policies to ensure that carer allowance for those for up to six months after bereavement. And we will continue to make that case for further support for carers going forward. The introduction of the carers allowance support, for example, on how we devolve powers can be used to help carers. And I hope that going forward, this government uses the powers that they do have to support Support that. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, Social Security in Scotland is finally starting to approach a stage that should be and that we want to see it progress. In the years to come, we now need to see far less delay and far much more ambition that the government talks about. This Parliament has received significant Social Security powers and we welcome that fact. But it is now up to this government to do more, to step up and deliver the massive potential these powers will bring to support individuals the length and breadth of Scotland to secure their prosperity for the future. And I support the amendment in Miles Briggs' name. Thank you. I call Carol Mokin to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I start my contribution to today's debate by highlighting my disgust at the hostile and cruel welfare system that is overseen by the Tories at Westminster. Their treatment of working people, their lack of compassion in helping those most in need, and their intrusive and discriminatory assessments are representative of a government not fit for office, a government not fit to represent the people of this country. And, presiding officer, I must say the Scottish Conservatives too have a responsibility for the actions of the UK government in relation to welfare and social security. The lack of opposition to it, and in some cases involvement in a government that has overseen such brutal cuts to social security, is shameful. <laughs> However, like colleagues have done already, I must stress that we must work across this parliament to tackle the impacts of the cost of living crisis, to ensure more people are not forced into poverty, and to alleviate the pressures facing working families on a daily basis. It is welcome that after significant pressure from the Labour Party that the SNP finally showed some political will to introduce a windfall tax. And it is also interesting, again, after Labour pressure, that a range of measures have been announced by the Treasury today to tackle the cost of living crisis after weeks of indecision and inaction. However, we must not ignore the fact, presiding officer, that these measures will come too late for many and will not be enough for the others. Indeed, presiding officer, we should also not ignore the fact that this is a powerful parliament. It, is the power, it has the power 
it has shown to deliver a Scottish child payment. And it is in the power of this Government to increase this further still by April next year. Yet it remains clear that despite increases in recent years, too many families eligible for the payment are not yet receiving it. And I say to the Minister that experts must be listened to. If the Scottish Government does not increase you let me finish. If the Scottish Government does not increase the speed at which eligible families are in receipt of the Scottish Child Payment, targets will be missed and more children will grow up in poverty. Eleanor Whitam. I thank the member for taking an, an intervention. Um, would Carol Mockin um, appreciate the fact that we do know about 77 per cent, or may, maybe even further than that now, of eligible children are in receipt of the Scottish Child Payment just now? But I also would like to ask if the member could explain if Labour has undertaken the analysis that if we further increase the Scottish Child Payment, at some point in time the DWP is going to have a knock-on effect to eligibility to universal credit, and that is absolutely a worrying factor for families across the country. Carol Mockin. Hi, um, I thank the member. I think I have uh, shown that I do support measures that the Scottish Government have taken, but we know that in actual fact it's uh, just of the one in four children that we know about that the child payment um, has helped. And so we need to do more to make sure that we are reaching all of the children living in, in poverty. Child poverty is one of the biggest challenges we face as a society, with more than one in four children um, living in poverty. Therefore, although I accept that our additional support for children and their families is welcome, um, as I've said, um, I do welcome you know, the current increases, but this is not a time for self-congratulatory emotions, which seem to be coming more and more from the Scottish Government. That is how it feels. In fact, it is a time to keep moving forward, to keep making progress, to be more radical and to end child poverty. That has to be the aim of this Parliament. And it is our job in opposition to hold the government to account on this. That is what my job is. And that is why I speak to these motions. Yes, I will. Michelle I mean, she's, she's making a very uh, powerful speech, and all credit to her for the sentiments she expressed at the beginning. But one concern for me is that consistently uh, in this Parliament, people fail to appreciate or acknowledge the macroeconomic powers that reside at Westminster, where there's a clear correlation between the ability to borrow in the open markets, for example, and then use that to fund these kind of improvements. So would she reflect on that? And therefore, if she agrees with me, what powers would she like to see directly in the control of this parliament? And will she be asking Westminster for them? Carol Mockin. I thank the member uh, for her intervention, and I don't want to get into that particular point of this. What I want to say is that, in my view, this Scottish Parliament is actually a powerful Parliament, and while we are debating these points, we should be doing everything that it has to move things forward, particularly for child poverty. We know what changes we can make if we act now. So I want to talk in this Parliament about what we can do, and I have repeatedly said that. Um, my colleague, Pang Dun Duncan Clancy, has also said this, um, and th th that what we want the, Scot the Scottish Government to do is what it can do, and with pace. That would be what we would like to see. Um, I want to talk a little bit about carers allowing supplement uplift and the delivery of the Scottish Carers Assistant Payment. The pandemic has only increased the difficulties for carers. Um, and it is clear that we need to move forward with this, this uh, benefit that, that we know can be, can be put in place. And I would ask the Scottish uh, Minister to, to uh, do some feedback on what they intend to do with, for carer support, um, because we know that carers are struggling uh, at this time. Um, I know I'm limited for time, um, so I'm going to move on. Um, in concluding... Ms Mockin, we do have time for we interventions. We do have time. OK, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we acknowledge that the government has said that the current carers allowance links closely to universal credit and income support payments and as such understand that the introduction of the Scottish Carers Assessment Payment will take time, but it's only right that where possible protection remains in place to support carers through uh, this incredibly difficult and stressful time. And as I say, I would hope that you could make some remarks about this so that we can offer support to carers. In concluding, President Officer, I will... Uh, be the first person to stand up and oppose the Tory UK government cuts to benefit and social security. But it's clear that in Scotland we can 
and we must do more. And my party will call out any hypocrisy from the Scottish Government, and we will also be relentless in our calls for them to do more and more radically to get that step further and to put in place protections for the most vulnerable in our society. And I repeat, this is not a time for the Scottish Government to pat itself on the back. It is a time to get out of the blocks, get on the job, look to making sure that we eradicate child poverty in Scotland, that we protect unpaired carers when we can, and we enhance the lives of some of the most vulnerable in our com community. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call Bob Doris to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There is one clear aspect of consensus in this afternoon's debate on the update on the delivery of Social Security benefits in Scotland. We all agree that Social Security is a human right and an investment in people. That is the only part of the Government motion that has not been deleted by, by opposition parties. There is actually a, a principle right at the heart of this where we can all agree on, and we should always strive to find that consensus where we can. And there is another key aspect of the Scottish Government motion where I think we can find consensus, and that is the key indicator of priorities set by the Scottish Government. Because in the motion, the Scottish, it talks about the Scottish Government's record investment of £3.9 billion in benefit expenditure in 2022-2023. And it acknowledges, and the Conservatives actually acknowledge this as well, is £360 million above that received by the UK Government. That provides meaningful social security support of, to over 1 million people, including low-income families and households, disabled people and carers. That is testament to the priority of the Scottish Government and the consensus within this Parliament. And I mainly block grant Parliament. That is a fundamental indicator of the priorities our Scottish Government has set, seeking to protect the most vulnerable in society. We have consensus. And it is clear to see where that expenditure is being invested. And we should remind ourselves, campaigners called for £5 a week of a Scottish child payment. The Scottish Child Payment is now currently £20 a week and soon to be £25 a week rolled out to children and low-income households right across Scotland. This year alone, that is an investment of £225 million to some of the poorest families right across this country. That is a testament to the priorities. And I, I was disappointed to see such a sweeping deletion of the Scottish Government's motion by the Labour Party this afternoon because it unfortunately seeks to remove, indeed all of it, but particularly because it seeks to remove some very strong cross-party success on the delivery of disability benefit reform in this place, led by our Scottish Government, but actually moulded by Parliament. I think Miles Briggs was reflecting some of that also. The yes? Pam Duncan Glancy. I, I thank Bob Doris for taking that intervention, and I understand his his disappointment at, at the deletion um, of, of substantial parts of the motion. But many, many, many disabled people and carers are still on in a, inadequate benefits. The eligibility criteria has not been changed or, or um, indeed does it, does it um, address anything like the 50% rule or the 20 metre rule. And those are the reasons why we couldn't support the government motion today. Bob Doris. Uh, I, I thank Pam Duncan Glance for that intervention. We'll say more about what we are doing uh, for, for those living with disabilities shortly. But you mentioned carers. This Scottish Government's increased carers allowing supplement by 13%. There's a real commitment to carers, Pam. I think that's a reasonable thing to put on the record. The in, not, not for the moment. Uh, the introduction of the child disability and adult disability payments to replace PIP is widely acknowledged, widely acknowledged as more humane, compassionate and dignified regarding the application and assessment process compared to the UK DWP regime. In particular, our partnership approach, partnership in this place, our partnership approach around clinically determined definitions of terminal illness, of fast tracking of awards and the introduction of indefinite awards will dramatically change the lives of many, many of my constituents, of all of our constituents, for the better. I know from my constituency caseload just now the corrosive, the destructive and the devastating impact the current process can have on individuals and families. These changes agreed by this Parliament will make a real difference. And our Parliament, led by the Scottish Government, but our Parliament should rightly 
be proud. Now, of course, we have to evaluate the impact of that, and we have our social security experience panels, and I know the Scottish Government want to monitor the success of the implementation of the new disability payments. I absolutely get that opposition parties will wish to push the Scottish Government further on the cost of living crisis, but to say that the Scottish Government, as some have done, uh, have done little for the poorest in society bears no relation to reality out there. Be that the Scottish Child Payment that I have spoken about, be that mitigating the bedroom tax, be it mitigating the, the, the benefits cap. In one moment, I will, yes. Be, be that uh, Scottish benefits have been operated by 6%. And this year alone, that is an additional £760 million in the system for the poorest in society because of decisions taken by this government. That is not little. That is substantive. But, of course, we we'll always want to try to seek to do more. Yep. Carol Mockham. Thank you. I, I, I thank you for your last statements, talking about wanting to do more. And I think that is the point that we are trying to make here. Um, and that a lot of the things that we are raising around the child uh, payment and around the carers' payments is because people with that experiencing experience are telling us that not enough is being done and that there is opportunity in a parliament like this who has, which has the powers that it has to do more. And, and so I think politicians sometimes need to stop patting themselves in the back and always say, what more can we do? Bob Doris. Can I thank Carol Walken for that intervention? I would like to point out the tone of my speech to congratulate the Parliament for the progress we have made rather than the Scottish Government, to, to be fair. But I do not think it is good enough for opposition politicians to rubbish the substantial progress that has been made in order to make a party political point. It just feels a little bit like that in relation to the, the Labour amendment. But I acknowledge we should always try to do more. We heard today about the low income winter. Uh, he heating assistance that will be delivered later this year, £50,000 to 400,000 uh, low-income households, a £20 million investment. Now, I suspect that later this year there will be calls for that to be £100 or £200 or £300. I get it. That is politics, but it has to be paid for. Likewise, Cares Allowing Supplement Support, we have heard already I put on record the 13 per cent increase the Scottish Government has provided for that, and we know there have been two additional payments during the coronavirus. But there are demands for, to go further again, and I get that, but it has got to be paid for. It is not enough just to cost what things will, will, will cost. You have to see where the money will come from, and the opposition parties are singularly silent in relation to where the money would come from. Uh, can, can I finish by, by, by mentioning two things briefly, presiding officer, if I have a little bit of time for the interventions that I have taken? The first of all is on, on staffing. I know from speaking to many people that one of the things that is happening with staffing is those who are sick and tired of the DWP system are making active choices to move from the DWP to Social Security Scotland and bringing their skill set and releasing their energies to the type of Social Security system that we actually want to see. And I would like to see to those people they are very welcome. Gaining jobs with Social Security Scotland, not losing them under DWP reforms, including in my constituency at Springburn. Finally, and I have to say to the Labour Party, I do not know where this money is going to come from, but I am going to say something that I would quite like to happen to the Scottish Government, and that is that uh, as this cost of living crisis really squeezes those most vulnerable, yes, putting money into the pockets of the most vulnerable as quickly as possible is the right thing to do, but there are lots of organisations, charities and third, order, third sector organisations right across my constituency and across all members' constituencies they will be looking to see what support they can be provided with to give that emergency food support, to give that emergency fuel support and give that emergency wraparound support, because not everyone will access all the benefits they are entitled to. Not everyone will budget such a tight budget accordingly to try and meet ends, and neither should they have to. So that emergency immediate support for trusted anchor organisations across their communities is absolutely vital. I do not know where the money is coming from, but whether the Scottish Parliament, the UK Parliament, someone has to find it, and we have to get the money out there into our communities to help the most vulnerable presiding officer. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Doris. Uh, I now call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Natalie Dawn for uh, a generous six minutes. Ms. Chapman. Thank you, presiding officer. Assuming control of a wide range of social security payments is one of the most challenging tasks this Parliament has ever undertaken. UK governments have spent years trashing our social security safety net, cutting payments, attacking benefit claimants, putting hurdles in the way of being able to appeal, and making vulnerable people endure humiliating assessments. 
These UK government attacks on the system triggered a United Nations investigation, which concluded that changes since 2010 amount to retrogressive measure measures in clear violation of the UK's human rights obligations. So, rebuilding the social security system in Scotland with the powers we have, then, is a huge task, but one to which this Parliament must rise. The biggest challenge is the introduction of, the, of new payments for disabled people. They account for about half of the expenditure of all the benefits that have been devolved and are claimed by as many as one in ten Scots. They have also been some of the most brutally cut, with some people losing as much as £7,700 as they were moved over to PIP, with women being more likely to lose entitlement than men. A better way of assessing applications is an important part of restoring fairness to the disability benefit system. Face-to-face -face assessments for PIP, which rarely proved necessary before PIP, were part of a deliberate, colour strategy to cut support for some of our most vulnerable people. As a result of years of campaigning by disabled people, Scottish Greens won a change in the law on this last session. It is now prohibited to conduct face-to-face -face assessments if the necessary information already exists. The onus is on the Scottish Government to collect that information, and where that is not possible, there is hope that the new client consultations will be less intrusive and a more supportive way of assessing entitlement. That will improve the experience of the, of the new system, but it will also have a bearing on the amount of support paid out. The Fiscal Commission estimates that by the end of this Parliament, 529 million extra pounds will be paid out in adult disability payment compared to PIP, with an additional 40 million knock-on impact for carers. It attributes that to the changes ADP introduces, including to how it is assessed. We are now two months into the new system, and we should be seeing the early impacts of these changes. It would be helpful if the Minister could update us in his closing on what impacts he has seen so far. However, it is simply not enough to change the way the payment is assessed. PIP did long-standing damage to the rights of disabled people by removing the lower rate care component and changing the mobility rule to 20 metres. In its report on the 20 metre rule, the MS Society reports moving to PIP negatively impacted on the mobility of 65% of MS sufferers and on the financial security of almost 80% of them. That is what makes the Scottish Government's review of disability benefits so important. Quite rightly, the mobility element of ADP must be prioritised as part of that. The review will be independent, but it must also have the broadest possible terms of reference, and no positive changes to the criteria must be off the table. In its paper on, on the review, the Scottish Government says that getting ADP up and running is, to quote, isn't the limit of our aspirations for improving disability assistance in Scotland. That is good to hear, and I hope that the Government works with disabled people to make those aspirations a reality. Rolling out the new system will not be complete until everyone who is entitled to claim is able to do so. The UK Government passed on to the Scottish Government some payments which were being claimed by less than half of those eligible. And some, like personal independent payments, did not even have published take-up statistics. The extra £1,200 per child that families will receive through the Scottish Child Payment when increased to £25 is key in achieving the child poverty reduction targets this Parliament has set itself. But current projections are that too many families will miss out, as many as 23% of eligible families, according to the, to the Scottish Fiscal Commission. And the cost of living crisis makes that even more crucial, that every penny is going where it should. But this is not an easy task. For years, successive UK governments have taken every possible opportunity to stigmatise those who need the help of the social security system. The Scottish Government's direction on this is encouraging. Reframing social security as an investment in society, not a drain on resources, is absolutely right. The £10 million investment in income maximisation services over this Parliament is also welcome, but I would encourage the Scottish Government to see what more funding might be available, given that the return for every £1 invested in money advice can be as much as £20. It is also good to see that progress is being made on benefits automation. 
with the Best Start grant, school and nursery grants, being paid automatically to Scottish child payment recipients from later this year. I was proud to work with the, with the Scottish Government to ensure that more support is available to those hit by the UK Government's cruel benefit cap. That work will start later this year, and I would appreciate it from the Minister an update on what is being done to make people aware of the extra support and how we can get it to them. To close, Presiding Officer, our social security system is the sign and signal of our care for one another. It should be and is based on some welcome fundamental principles of social security being a human right and as a collective investment. Are we there yet in fully realising those principles? No. Do we need to keep looking at options for increasing benefit eligibility? Yes. But with an additional 760 million expenditure over this session, an end to heartless face-to-face -face assessments and progress on automating benefits, we are moving very definitely towards a more compassionate social security system, one of which we should all be proud. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Chapman. Uh, I now call on Natalie Dawn to be followed by Faisal Chowdhury. Again, a generous six minutes, Ms Dawn. Thank you, President Officer. I am extremely proud of the route that Scotland is taking with our delivery of social security benefits. A compassionate, humane system with dignity, fairness and respect at its core. A system that sees social security as a human right, not a burden. The Minister has laid out some detail of the 12 benef benefits that Scotland has power over, seven of which are brand new and unique to Scotland, such as the Scottish Child Payment, the most ambitious child poverty reduction measure in the whole of the UK. And as well as creating new benefits, we are delivering a new approach where social security in Scotland is shaped by people with direct experience of the current UK benefit system in an effort to ensure that people are at the heart of our approach. The very recent Audit Scotland report, which has been touched on today, found that there had been a conscious focus on the needs of claimants and that people have been really positive of their experience of engaging with Social Security Scotland. Commenting on the system, claimants have made comments such as, my overall experience, I would say, was compassionate. There's no need for improvement as they are doing a first-class service. Now, I've never in my life heard anyone describe the UK welfare state as a first-class service. It's more like a misery. Now, I've sat in this chamber for over a year and listened to the slurs from the Conservative benches telling us that we need to do better, that we need to do more to alleviate poverty. But how any Conservative MSP can have the brass neck to say that is beyond me. How long has the UK government had to make life better for people in this country? How many times do you have to be told that the UK welfare system is inadequate and failing your constituents? Evidence gathered from the Social Justice Committee's debt inquiry heard that universal credit waiting times are one of the biggest contributors to people falling into debt, a policy that was written on the back of a fag packet by an out-of-touch minister in London. The UK welfare state used to give enough money so that people could just about scrape by, but now it doesn't even do that. The Conservative Party's response to the cost of living crisis has been deemed woefully inadequate by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. And to be honest, that's putting it kindly. It's an absolute riot, really. For a start, the Prime Minister should resign. Perhaps my Conservative colleagues could grow a spine and stop supporting illegal parties, sleaze, corruption, and stop with this complete hypocrisy when it comes to the UK benefit system, as it fools no one. And I also want to touch briefly on the amendment from the Scottish Labour Party. The Labour amendment is essentially saying that we haven't done enough to alleviate poverty, which is confusing because we've already heard today of all the new measures that Scotland has taken to ensure a more positive and humane system. However, not just now, I'm going to finish this point, thank you. However, this is what the Labour Party in Scotland have become. And instead of laying an amendment calling on the UK government to devolve all social security powers to Holyrood, it seems that they would rather that they stayed with the Tories at Westminster and try in vain to attack the Scottish government instead. They would rather, presiding officer, that the powers over the six-week assessment period on universal credit, powers over the rape clause, powers that mean children in this country have to use food banks, they want those powers to remain in the clutches of the Tories in Westminster. 
Not at the moment, thank you. I need to make progress. Presiding officer, the Labour Party have absolutely no credibility when it comes to Social Security. It is of little surprise that their party was once again rejected at the ballot box and until they actually realise that the only way to truly tackle poverty is for our parliament to have all the powers of any other independent country, then anything they say in this place about how Scotland should tackle poverty is a token gesture at best. Now, I want to take a moment to highlight people going for PIP assessments. The UK government created a system that makes people have to think of what they are like on their worst day, because anything less than that and their money is harshly and unjustifiably taken away from them. How warped is that? For anyone who has ever experienced this or helped someone fill in these forms or take this assessment, you will know that it is a degrading and distressing process. Well, Scotland has taken a different approach. And the rollout of Scottish Social Security benefits is proven a success. But let me remind the Chamber, this is despite having limited powers and despite having a Tory government who have presided over a benefit system that punishes, degrades and damages those who need support the most. Renowned for its harshness and degrading nature, the UK benefit system has been condemned by the UN for its callous approach. People in poverty in the United Kingdom in the 21st century have died, and that falls at the feet of the UK welfare system and an austerity agenda that targets those that are trapped in the cycle of poverty that this system has created. The Scottish Government have achieved more with our social security system in four years than has been achieved in decades. Not just now, I, I really need to make progress, sorry. In four years than has been achieved in decades under Labour and Tory governments down south. And this is important to repeat. We do not have all the powers. The concrete boots of Westminster that we are currently wearing in Scotland must be taken into consideration when discussing our social security system. We are undertaking a complex process of the like that has never been seen before. Yet, there, yes, there will be challenges and yes, there will be things that can be improved, but we are just at the very beginning of creating a wonderful system for all of our constituents. So finally, presiding officer, while I am confident this system will only continue to improve, it is high time the Conservatives and the rest of this chamber get real and address the elephant in the room, that we will never, ever be able to fully build the truly transformative system that we need in this country without all the powers of independence. With all the powers of Social Security, we won't have to worry about the UK undermining the good work going on in our country at every step of the way. Thank you, Ms Stone. I now call Faisal Chowdhury uh, to be followed by Emma Roddick for uh, around six minutes. Mr. Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The motion before us is frankly disappointing. Uh, the Scottish Government could have given us a measured assessment of its progress towards implementing devolved social security. It could have given us an honest appraisal of the challenges that lay ahead in implementing those benefits. Instead, we have been presented with a torrent of self-congratulation for a job that is not even half done. The Scottish Labour Amendment notes that the grand scale of the rhetoric of developed benefit from the Scottish Government in years gone by. To read the motion before us today, you would think that this was a lap of victory by the Scottish Government rather than a report on its early progress. But there is much more to be done and many uncertainties that will need addressing along the way. The Audit Scotland report raises several notes of caution. It does so on staffing levels for adult disability payments. It stresses how, how many unknowns there are and how <clears throat> adaptable Social Security Scotland will have to be to administer the benefit effectively. It says, and I quote, the resource implement, <coughs> implement, uh, impl impl implication of how adult disability payment is administered will only become clear once it is fully rolled out with the case transfer underway. This is not a small consideration. Social Security Scotland will have to be able to respond extremely rapidly if cases ex exceed exceptions or if other problem arises. 
While we all hope this process will be smooth, the challenges should not be underestimated. Yet the motion before us makes no mention of this challenge. On the extension of Scottish child payments, the Audit Scotland report highlights significant risk in the Scottish Government approach to bridging the digital infrastructure gaps with the Department for Work and Pensions. While the report acknowledges that efforts are underway to manage the risk, we can all think of examples of new government IT system at all levels of government which we've had significant problems in their early days. The Audit Scotland report also highlights the problem of replacement being needed to the DWP payments platform after the Scottish government's now extended agreements to use it expires in 2024. Yes, the first thing the Scottish Government did upon getting this uh, devolved service was to hand it back to the West Minister to run. And we are supposed to be believe in their capability to manage in independent Scotland. The report said this is a critical aspect of Social Security Scotland's digital infrastructure and a long-term solution will need to be put in place to provide suitable payments functionality for Social Security Scotland beyond this point. Another big project, another mysterious time scale, another unknown cost, which leads me uh, to my final point, the issue of 760 million black hole in the Social Security funding uh, by 2025. The Audit Scotland report says, and I again quote, sorry, I, I want to uh, progress. <clears throat> the Scottish Government needs to plan for how it uh, manages the long-term sustainability uh, of this expenditure and be clear about how it will improve outcome for the Scottish people. The Scottish Government needs to be clearer with the Scottish people. How often must we hear these words in this place? We cannot underestimate the challenges faced here. These are difficult process, ones that can literally mean life and death for people affected by them. They must be given a honest and realistic appraisal. The Scottish Government is taking on a vitally important part of the state. It has made repeated claims that it can run them better than Westminster. But looking at the motion before us today, it risks doing so with complacency. We all know that SNP can talk the talk. On, on an issue as important as this, we need them to learn the lesson of their past failures. Cracks in a social security system cannot just be painted over like an unfinished ferry. We need them to understand that this time the consequence for under de delivering could be truly catastrophic. Unfortunately, the Scottish Government's motion shows little sign of the gravity of the situation. I will be supporting Scottish Labour, man Labour amendments today. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Chowdhury. I now call the final speaker in the open debate, Emma Roddick, for a, a very generous six minutes. Ms Roddick. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I have heard this term self-congratulatory uh, thrown at the Scottish Government as if it's an accusation of something horrific a few times this afternoon, and I want to take a moment first just to respond to it. Firstly, it is perfectly normal to celebrate achievements, and I sincerely believe that achievements are being made by the front bench on this issue that are worth celebrating. But more importantly, Surely there should be some recognition that this debate and this motion don't just serve the Scottish Government by highlighting the progress that it's making, but that it also tells the public that these benefits exist and that the Scottish Government wants them to claim them if eligible, that it wants to help them to receive financial support, because that's not a given. That's not the message that other governments have sent disabled people in this country in the past. 
Today's motion is actually incredibly meaningful beyond what Labour and the Tories have been trying to reduce it to. And I want to be clear that this issue is personal for me. I am a disabled person. I am in receipt of PIP. I've been through the process and I've helped countless others through it and their appeals, often with plenty of tears. As our committee convener, Elena, um, mentioned in her contribution, I visited Social Security Scotland in Dundee very recently. And she's right, it truly was very emotional for me to see just how differently things are already being done. Rather than disabled people feeling that the process is trying to catch them out, we will be faced with accessible language, illustrations, helpful prompts to ensure that we are giving the assessors all the relevant information that they need. And instead of having to seek out a CAB advisor with a points cheat sheet, the help is built into the application itself. Rather than a private contractor being encouraged to turn down requests for assistance, assessments when needed will be done in-house and in a way that works for the applicant. No more forcing people who have chronic pain and mobility issues to come in for an assessment just so that someone can peer through the window and make sure that they really are in agony. As someone who is dragged across town to be stared and sneered at and then asked by an ATOS assessor why, if I felt suicidal and had been depressed for so long, I hadn't been successful in killing myself, I do not underestimate the difference that this will make two lives. The word trauma has been used already a few times today and the DWP's approach has been traumatising. It has made people worse and it has caused immeasurable pain and suffering. The changes already made will have a huge effect on the experience of claimants, particularly those with mental health issues, chronic conditions or a terminal illness. I do think we have to be realistic and fair this afternoon and it's a shame that so many have chosen not to be. Massive improvements have been made, huge strides in social security and social justice in Scotland thanks to this SNP government's approach to implementing a new system. It is not a small thing that people are now being treated with respect when they come forward for help rather than suspicion. It is not a minor change that disabled people will no longer have to seek out an advocate from CAB to tell them what they need to mention on their forms. And it's not nothing that we are building at pace a fairer system for Scotland. However, an inescapable truth is that so much of our hard work and the impact of decisions to prioritise spending on social security here in Scotland is constantly reduced to mitigation purely through the fact that we are tied to a Conservative UK government which wants to reduce welfare spending rather than increase it. The Scottish Government gives money directly to families in poverty, trusting parents to spend the money where it is needed and tackle child poverty, while the UK Government sticks a cap on how many kids you can help to feed. The Scottish Government doubles the Scottish child payment, adding a tenner a week, and the UK Government takes 20 quid off that same family's income. The Scottish Government mitigates and mitigates, spending millions ensuring that Scots are not affected by the hated bedroom tax, pouring money into the Scottish Welfare Fund to give crisis funding to those who have been left behind by the UK Government. And we've heard today that the Scottish Government is acting with one hand tied behind its back. The Scottish Government is acting with money being taken out of the pockets of the people that it is fighting to pull out of poverty. We go to the UK Government. I'll take an intervention. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, and I appreciate the, the members um, taking the intervention. In, in an example recently where um, Rishi Sunak uh, who <laughs> gave a, a much too late and very inadequate uh, £150 to people in council tax, and that came to Scotland in Barnet Consequentials, the Scottish Government made exactly the same choice. So how could the, how could the member explain that when the government in Scotland had the same amount of money, they made the same decisions as the Tories rather than target it at families who needed the most? Emma Roddick. Um, I think that's, that's one very specific example, and if that were the only thing that the Scottish Government was doing to help people in poverty, then I, I might agree with, with Pam Duncan Glancy, but you know, as, as I've just mentioned, there are plenty of other things that are going on, including brand new benefits to help people and target to families who are going to be experiencing poverty, and more importantly, whose children might be growing up in poverty. We do go to the UK Government and tell them this, and they say, well, you have the powers now. And Sure, we've got the powers, but they're keeping the money and they won't let us borrow our own and devolve more fiscal powers, which would make a world of difference when designing a brand new system. And my colleague Natalie Dawn put it well when she talked about powers in the UK undermining us every step of the way. This two-tier system doesn't work. Separate governments with conflicting ideologies dealing with two ends of one system doesn't work. Social Security makes the point more than anything else that this union doesn't work. 
For real change, for the policies that Scotland votes for, which are progressive, not conservative, we need independence. We are swimming against the tide here, trying to do what's right for the people of Scotland with limited fiscal powers. You would think Labour would spend a moment joining us in trying, but you'd think listening to them today that there's no difference between the direction being taken here and the direction being taken by the Tories down south. The difference is huge, and I think people will see that. I think many other disabled people and people in poverty across the Highlands and Islands and across Scotland will get their Social Security Scotland letters and feel as emotional as I did when I was in Dundee. If I can, get I can give you the time back, back Ms Roddick, certainly. Uh, Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the member for taking the intervention. And I, you know, I, I have said in my speech, and my colleagues have also said in, in their speech, that we welcome the change in direction in terms of assessment processes. And, and as I said earlier, the bar wasn't high. But the reality is, still people in, in Scotland are living in desperate, desperate, desperate states. So it is not the case that just because we take a different direction, it has a different impact on people. And that's why we have placed our support in, in, our, in our motion to, to look at doing things much, much more differently to put people, money in the pockets of people who need it the most. Emma Roddick. I, I just think it's disingenuous to, to suggest that the changes that are being made in policy at the moment by the Scottish Government will not have an impact. And I think it's easy to shout more, more, more when you don't actually have to write the budget. But more than that, Scottish Labour's manifesto last year contained a policy to double the Scottish child payment. The Scottish Government has done what Scottish Labour said it would do if it were in its position just now. So um, I, I think you know, reacting to a government delivering again and again as far as possible on what your own party wanted to happen by taking issue with celebrating progress or describing it as, as little action um, is contrary behaviour that, that my mum would have rightly described as thrawn. I, I think I'm done with the interventions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our system is fit for the future and focused on delivering benefits to people, not gatekeeping and trying to cheat folk out of what they are entitled to. And it is worth, I think, all of us here telling people how different things are going to be and how differently they are going to be treated. We all have a duty to get that message across and to be genuine, not awfulise any creases that are going to be ironed out. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Roddick. We now move to the closing speeches. I call firstly Mark Griffin, who joins us online for uh, a generous six minutes. Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Um, sorry, I can't be in the chamber today. I've got a, a sick child at home, which means I can't take um, interventions, I think, which maybe detract from the sense of the debate, but also because of the generous allocation of time that you, you've given me. I think today's debate has been somewhat familiar. Uh, the government benches have, as always, uh, much to congratulate themselves for while the rest of us are still waiting for the real delivery to happen. But on reflecting on the progress the government have made in a debate and something, some of the things they're rightly congratulating themselves for in terms of um, banning private sector assessment, lifetime awards, um, hopefully a move towards payments at some point. So, I have to reflect that a lot of those came about because of Labour amendments to the original Social Security Act in the first place, and it came about as a result of pressure from opposition members. But every year, it seems almost for half a decade that it's somehow the biggest year for the new system. But I guarantee members what disabled people, carers and families struggling to put food on the table want is to go about their lives and to have a system that they can rely on. What they want is a system complete so that they can realise the human right of social security and investment the motion talks about. And as Pam Duncan Glancy said, what we actually have is three and four families not getting the child payment, disabled people still subject to the 20 metre rule, and carers not knowing when their benefit will be fully paid by the Scottish Government. Now, Social Security is the money that insulates the poorest in society from financial shocks and protects people from being driven into poverty. It is uh, both a lifeline and a right. But the safe and secure transition promised before real changes are made, I think, is taking far too long, and it is costing people up and down Scotland. The, the irony is that those delays are simultaneously compounding the understaffing and black hole funding. Now, 
pocketing £700 million, as highlighted by Faisal Chowdhury. Um, with vital resources being expended on pricey IT contractors and DWP bills, instead of being directly invested in the people of Scotland. And the, the opportunity to discuss these delays and the financial costs of establishing the system have been far too few since this programme began, when you consider the cost and complexity of, of the system. So I, I want to echo the comments from Miles Briggs and Willie Rennie, who talked about the costs of establishing this system, which have more than doubled since we passed the original Social Security Act. And barely weeks before the pandemic, the government published a long overdue updated business case outlining costs in excess of two billion pounds to 2025, including an admission that the DWP would pocket 400 million pounds to run the benefits while we waited for the Scottish system to come on stream. Now, likely very much out of date, a further update, I think, should have been published ahead of today's debate. And fundamentally, the Scottish Government have underestimated the complexity of ASK and have been unable to specify or control what exactly in that original plan has led to the substantial delays and additional costs. And the recent audit saw some bleak warnings stating that time scales are challenging and substantial risks remain, that hardworking staff are having to juggle with temporary and manual processes. And the Scottish Government has extended its deal with the DWP to use their payment system, and the number of contractors has uh, doubled. Now, members have spoken about the desire across the whole chamber to embed a human rights approach in the forthcoming disability and carers benefits. But by mirroring the UK eligibility rules, I seriously, I seriously doubt that we can achieve that. Audit Scotland reports um, ominously that a swathe of benefits are still classed as being replanned, um, including employment injuries assistance. And members will know from previous speeches that I am pursuing a bill to establish the Scrutiny and Research Council for such a, a benefit, because a simple rebrand wouldn't, I think, deliver the human rights-based approach nor the, the dignity, fairness and respect we aspire to. Changes are required now. And while we continue to await the government consultation, I hope we can meet to discuss aligning our work before I uh, lodge my bill later this year. And the, the genesis of that bill was asking the question of trade unions, should COVID be an industrial disease? And given how many caught COVID at work simply for doing their jobs and in too many cases virtually destroying their ability to work, I think the answer remains an overwhelming yes. And I would be delighted if the Minister closes today by confirming that people with long COVID will have entitlement to employment injuries assistance. Now, similarly, unless there is a, a fundamental change in that benefit, employment injuries assistance, the Parliament will soon be asked to accept regulations for a devolved benefit with an equalities impact assessment, which will say that only 7% of applications for that entitlement would come from women. And, President Officer, it, it's clear, um, I hope, that that would be entirely unacceptable to this chamber, but that would be the case if a lift and shift approach was taken. Doing so would risk embedding a system that promotes inequalities and fails to reflect modern Scotland. And that number is so low because women are ultimately denied entitlement to the Westminster benefit because it's a benefit for the injuries and diseases that men got at work in the last century. As a result, cleaners with respiratory and skin diseases are not recognised by the current scheme. Um, a breast cancer that is caused by shift work, that's the top occupational cancer in women, is not recognised. Even asbestos-related ovarian cancer which is the most common gyne gynecological cancer in the UK, is not recognised. But, President Officer, women are missing entirely from that scheme, but they will have to wait for further replanning, it, it seems. Despite the rhetoric, the, the promised transformational changes to benefits 
promised, the dignity, fairness and respect still not yet being delivered. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Griffin. Uh, I now call on Jeremy Balfour for around nine minutes, Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Let me follow in Willie Rennie's uh, footsteps uh, by starting uh, with some positives uh, in my speech. Um, I think there is a consensus amongst the whole of this Parliament that we want these devolved social security benefits to work. Uh, we saw that when the bill went through. We have seen that in committee. And I do wish the Minister well. I'm glad he's taken his jacket off, his sleeves are rolled up, and we will support him where that is going well. But we will also critique when it is not going well. That is the role of, op of opposition. Because the devolution of some areas of the welfare system presented a welcome opportunity for Scotland to create a uniquely Scottish approach to Social Security that is underpinned by the broad shoulders of a UK welfare state. Scotland, having two governments working together, provides the ability to enact local policies with the backing of a larger national purse. But unfortunately, presiding officer, once again, the powers handed to this SNP government have been squandered, resulting in Social Security falling far short of its potential. The motion that we've been debating today amounts to nothing more, as others have said, of this government giving itself a massive pat on the back. A pat on the back, I might add, that is entirely misplaced. Either the SNP are burying their heads in the sand and ignoring their shortcomings, or we really believe that a record of delay, inefficiency, is the best we can do in this country. Because make no mistake, Social Security Scotland has not had a smooth start. Every estimate that the Scottish Government has made has been drastically wrong. Miles Briggs pointed some of these out in his speech earlier. The SNP stated it would cost £307 million to set up the agency. The numbers ballooned to £651 million, over 100% over budget. The SNP claimed that Social Security Scotland would require 1,900 people to operate. Again, this number has almost doubled to 3,500. Again and again, the SNP make the same mistake. They present favourable numbers that inevitably end up being shown as fantasy when it comes to reality. But, presiding officer, the list of problems does not end with the setting up of Social Security Scotland. It is an ongoing issue. Admin costs at Social Security Scotland have gone from 36 million in 2019-20 to 130 million in 2021. Staff costs have almost doubled over the same period, whilst other admin costs increased from 13.8 million to 88 million. These are not small margins of error. We're talking about millions of pounds of taxpayers' money that should be going into the pockets of those who need it, not wasted on a bureaucracy that the Scottish Government has created and encouraged. This is unacceptable. In a moment, this is unacceptable. In any other sector, this kind of gross mismanagement would not be tolerated and could even lead to people been fired. But in this SNP world, the government not only tolerates it, but is so proud of, that, of its record that we come to Parliament this afternoon to showcase it and to ask us to support a motion saying how wonderful they are. These cost overruns and missed targets would be more understandable if the service for claimants are receiving was of high quality. But instead of being let down by a government that is more focused on sound bites and headlines than truly providing those in need. Absolute. Minister. Thank Mr Balfour for take, uh, taking the intervention. Would he acknowledge uh, the very positive client feedback that Social Security Scotland has had, where over 90 per cent see the service as good or very good, and also the fact that because Social Security Scotland is delivering seven benefits which aren't available elsewhere in the UK, 
That has required additional resourcing and investment. So we are doing more, and we need to invest in that, not just to build a system for the future, but to make sure we deliver in the here and now. Jeremy Balfour. Well, well, let me come on to that, because across the board, processing times are unacceptable. It's taken far too long to get money into the hands, and sometimes the money's not even reaching the bank account at the right time. Let's look at the figures as we have them. Not my figures before the Minister stands up and says, Minister from Social Security, Scotland. In December 2021, only 1% of Scottish child payments were processed within 10 days. Only 5% of funeral payment applications were processed within 10 days, the average being as high as 18. 4% of young care grant claims were processed within 10 days, and only 2% of Best Start grant applications were processed within 10 days. Over the Easter weekend, and here is the hard-hitting figure that affects real individuals, over the Easter weekend, presiding officer, over 2,000 Scottish child and Scottish child disability payments were delayed by more than one working day. That, that represents 20% of all claims. The payments were due on Thursday the 14th of April, but weren't received until Tuesday the 19th of April because of a holiday weekend. That meant that families went without the expected money for four days. Alistair Allen. I, I thank the member for giving way. He, he mentions delays over weekends and so forth. This has been pointed out already in this debate, but he is aware, I take it, that the delay associated with applying for the UK's universal benefit is five weeks before the first payment is made. Jeremy Balfour. By design. By design. Can I say to remember very gently, we're talking about benefits related to disability. Let me make one point very clear, President Officer. I have been... Uh, are you wanting to make a point? Cabinet Secretary. So you're saying that five weeks is OK because it's delivered by the UK Tory government. Is that what you're saying? Seriously? Through the chair, please, Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. I am saying, Cabinet Secretary, that we are debating benefits that have been devolved to this government to look after. And what I'm saying, as someone that has been in receipt of PIP for 25 years, on not one occasion, not on one occasion, has that payment been laid into my account, You've been running a system for months and you've already failed. President Officer, these are not only statistics. They represent real people going through real hardship who need real help. How do you think it looks to them that this government is celebrating its performance? Uh, no, I'm sorry, I've run out of time. A performance that shows crippling inefficiency and has left people waiting. There can be no doubt Social Security Scotland is not fulfilling its full potential. I don't blame them, I blame this government. And something has to change, presiding officer. I support the amendment in the name of Miles Briggs and I implore others in the chamber to do so. We will be critical friends, we want to see this work, but stop saying you've got it right when you simply have failed on so many occasions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr Balfour. A gentle reminder to colleagues, the only you in the chamber is the chair, so please address my remarks through the chair. Uh, with that, Minister, I'd be obliged if you could take us up to just before decision time. Thank you. Next week, next Wednesday to be precise, is the fourth anniversary of Royal Assent of the Social Security Scotland Act, which this chamber, to its very great credit, passed unanimously. And one of the important aspects of that Act was that we legislated for the principles in which we would deliver devolved Social Security. One of those principles states very clearly that Social Security is an investment in the people of Scotland. This has been acknowledged in today's debate and it has been great to hear the reflections of colleagues from Carl Monaghan to Maggie Chapman to Bob Doris to many others. We talked about the change in culture that we are leading. And that's after decades of Social Security being top down in the public consciousness and by governments elsewhere. Particularly the Conservative government and in coalition with the Liberal Democrats. But it all started actually in the new Labour era when Tony Blair talked about welfare should become a hand up, not a hand out, as if a hand out was a bad thing to happen. 
And actually, this is an important place to start because the ideological opposition to welfare has got us to this point where we're having to make so many interventions to get our society back to the place where we do eradicate poverty and we do make a bigger difference so we can fulfil everyone's potential. So to this Parliament's credit, we agreed on that shared principle that investment in the people of Scotland is what social security is all about. And we need to continue to build on that. And that's what today's debate has been about. It's about reflecting and listening and aiming to do more. Because we are leading on these islands. Whatever your view on the constitutional position, we are the ones collectively who are reinvigorating the concept of social security being an important aspect and a necessary aspect and something that should not be stigmatised on these islands. So, quite rightly in that framework, people are asking government to do more. And they're asking UK government to do more. And I was glad to see today that the Chancellor used some of his vast powers to tackle the cost of living crisis. A windfall tax, which I called for as Public Finance Minister in this chamber a couple of years ago. But also action to... Uh, I, I'm not taking uh, personal um, credit for that. I'm just saying it's been an idea that's been around a while. And um, we're glad to see it finally happen. And we will see uh, if that has any benefit for Scotland, of course, which we're, we're not clear on at the moment. But we have seen interventions using the universal credit system, the pension system, and also uh, for those on disabled benefits. And, 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 and we welcome that. However, it is inadequate in terms of the longer term. And we were uh, disappointed to see that further investment in terms of an uplift in universal credit has not been delivered. <coughs> so we will continue to push the UK government to do more. And of course, they are unwinding on all the problems that they've created for themselves by not investing in social security and, and delivering vast cuts to public, uh, to, 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 to the public purse and uh, also uh, household budgets for a significant time. A number of members in today's debate, Willie Rennie, Karen Monaghan and others, talked about how you want us to, to do more in the Scottish Government. And, and we will do more, and I laid some of that out in my opening statement. But we are working within a limited budget. This Parliament has some taxation powers, but they are limited. So we have to make choices as a collective, as a democracy. And we have to be serious in those choices. And that's about, in a fixed budget position, if, you want to, if, if we want to invest in, in, in one area of support, then where does that resource come from? And in the period ahead, this really serious time, I think we need to raise our game collectively as we go towards the next budget process on these points. I will, yes. I'm Duncan Glancy. Um, and I, I appreciate the, the intervention. In, in two specific areas, the Labour Party have come to the government with suggestions about how they could use the money that they have and told them where they could get the money from to either um, reach children who were over six so that they could get the Scottish Child Payment and so that they could get it at the double rate, or that you could put £400 in the pockets of the families who needed it the most. There, there were examples of how you could have used how the government, forgive me um, for, for doing this about the twelfth time, <laughs> President Officer, um, how, how the government here could have used their powers to put money in people's pockets. But, but the government have refused to heed our calls. Can, can the government say why? Minister. As Pam Duncan Glancy knows, I, I, I very much respect her constructive suggestions in good faith. Um, but uh, the, 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 the process that Pam Duncan Glancy engaged in from memory, and correct me if I'm wrong, was not in synergy with the budget process. So I think we have to be, we have to be clever and um, we have to be focused as we go into this budget process to make sure that we utilise resources effectively in the period. And part of that is ab about, about um, carers. And I know Carol Monaghan asked for, for more detail about how we will deliver the Scottish uh, carers' assistance, our, our, our benefit. I talked about in my opening remarks the timetable in which we will deliver that. As I said, the consultation for that just closed in recent days. So I will come back to Parliament uh, to, to committee on what the proposals were um, and, and how we will deliver them. I will take an intervention. Miles Briggs. 
the Minister for taking this intervention. In terms of budget scrutiny and future projections, we know there's £760 million now being projected uh, to fund these welfare policies by 2026. Now, Willie Rennie, myself, Mark Griffin, has raised that point. Where are the Scottish Government going to lay out where that money will come from and what budgets potentially will be cut? We've seen over £250 million cut from local authorities, for example. Where will that come from? Minister. So, uh, uh, I, th I think Miles Briggs raised an important point so that we, we, we through the medium term financial strategy and the, the, the positions that the, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance uh, will, will take in the period ahead and what she will set out to Parliament, of course collectively we will have to make decisions on our budget position as we go further ahead. But the Scottish Government is committed to providing the Social Security benefits of, of, of which we have we've made um, uh, provision for and, and, and in which we have set out in our programme. Uh, the question for this Parliament will be, as always, in a fixed Parliament, how do we balance the budget? I mean, of course, the, 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 the big flaw in Miles Briggs's argument is that the Conservatives never come with a, a balanced position. It's always spend more and tax less, um, and it just doesn't have a, a, a sensical or credible position. Um, in terms of uh, the, the, the period ahead, I, I, I will also um, be setting out in, in, in due course uh, how we finish the, the programme of, of devolved benefits. There, I've been able to update Parliament today where possible. Um, there is another uh, business, uh, programme business case that we will publish by the end of the year, but we also have to, as I said, work with the DWP, and we're not in a position yet uh, to be able to uh, give full clarity with them, uh, but we will do to Parliament in, in due course. Um, I am dispirited somewhat, President Officer, that today there have been a number of um, members who have accused the Scottish Government of um, backpatting. Um, acknowledging acknowledging uh, the, the, a difference that a government has made is, is, is not backpatting. It is actually an effective mechanism, as Emma Roddick emphasised, for raising awareness of benefits and helping our constituents. And, you know, the, there is more to do, and we appreciate and acknowledge that. But there is a lot that's been done. The child disability payment has already helped 3,000 more children at a cost of £3 million. The Young Carer Grant has helped 4,000 people at a cost of £1.6 million. Child Winter Heating Assistance, one of our new benefits, made 20,000 payments in the last year of £4 million. The Carers Allowance Supplement has paid £188 million to 126,000 carers since 2018. That's support that's not available elsewhere in the UK. The Scottish Child Payment is supporting over 100,000 children as we speak. Yeah. And when we roll it out and extend it, we'll be supporting 400,000 children. 400,000 children across Scotland. That's using our powers. That's making a difference. We're mitigating against the bedroom tax at a cost of £350 million. That's money that we shouldn't be having to waste on that. We're going to be mitigating the benefit cap, a cost of £10 million. And I'm very happy to update Maggie Chapman that we will be working with local authorities to raise awareness of how to do that and the third sector as well. And for those who today criticised our adult disability payment, I say listen to what Elena Whittam and Emma Roddick said about the difference that they saw when they went to learn about adult disability payment at Social Security Scotland. An invitation was extended to the Conservative and Labour benches. They did not take it up, but we look forward to uh, welcoming them. Point of order, Miles Briggs. Thank you. I think the Minister should maybe apologise, because committee members, including myself and other members, went to that uh, briefing with Social Security Scotland. Two members who did go couldn't attend, and so have gone. So I think he needs to correct the record. Um, while that is not a point of order, it is now on the record. But I, I, I'm, I'm happy to clarify that uh, we will be very happy to invite members from the committee again. But come, you, you have been, but, uh, members have been, but they haven't been to the follow-up uh, session where they would have been taken through the application form for adult disability payment and, and seen the difference that it made. Um, and some Conservative members um, made statements about the fact that uh, they did not feel that the eligibility criteria was correct. Of course, a very simple way of changing that would be for the UK Government to change the eligibility criteria for PIP across the UK. We are not going to create a two-tier system, and uh, members know that we are looking very seriously through our independent review at what changes could potentially be made. 
Presiding officer, um, I know that there are different views, of course, in this chamber on Scotland's constitutional future. Um, and I, we are responsible for building a system that will serve the needs of Scotland, whatever the outcome of the next referendum on independence. But I also know that there wouldn't be a Scottish social security system if it wasn't for all of those who campaigned for yes in 2014, and I want to acknowledge their contribution. There's more. There is much more that we want to do, presiding officer, with the powers that we have and new powers that we think this parliament should have. But our focus right now is on making the biggest difference we can with the powers and resources we have. And I make a plea to Parliament. We need to work together to be constructive, to help give our constituents as much support as we can in this time of need. We are happy to accept criticism, but creating cynicism for political point scoring is just unhelpful in this situation. We need opposition parties to stop talking down Please Social conclude, Security Minister. Scotland and actually get behind the shared project in, in actions as well as words to help their constituents. We have made remarkable progress and together we will do a lot more. So instead of thinking about the next headline or election, let's unite and help the people that we represent. Thank you, President. That concludes the debate on update on delivery of social security benefits, it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. And I ask George Adam, on behalf of the parliamentary bureau, to move motions 4617 on committee membership and 4618 on committee substitutes. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. The question on these motions will be put at decision time, and there are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. And the first is that Amendment 4621.1 in the name of Miles Briggs, which seeks to amend Motion 4621 in the name of Ben McPherson on update on delivery of social security benefits, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we'll move to a vote and there'll be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.